Good afternoon. Good evening. Whichever one it is, I'm not quite sure. I'm, <laughs> I'm, it's a good start, isn't it? Um, I'm Emma Dench. I'm Interim Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, and I'm here to welcome you most warmly to our highlight of the year, our sixth Harvard Horizon Symposium. Whoa! <laughs> In just a few minutes, we're going to be wowed by our eight extraordinary Harvard Horizon scholars who will perform the incredible feat of conveying to us the essence of their research in just five minutes. Whoa, ho, ho! <laughs> in a manner, and this is the important bit that even I will understand. Go for it. Harvard Horizons is the brainchild of Professor Issa Kuriyama, fostered by Dean Shaoli Meng, and the focus of expertise and care of many amazing people for months and years. I always think that Harvard Horizons can look like a Hogwarts banquet, especially in this space, it mirac miraculously appearing treats um, as if by magic. Um, but there's very heavy lifting behind the scenes, and um, I wanted to give a few shout outs. Um, shout out for Harvard Horizons faculty fellows, yay! GSAS leaders and GSAS staff, yeah. <laughs> staff, of the, staff of the Derek Box Center for Teaching and Learning. And here I would like to, I'm going to name two names. It's invidious to name names, but I just have to. Two quite remarkable people. To Pamela Pollock, yeah. <laughs> Pamela who's coached and guided our scholars through their highs and their lows. I'm sure they'll attest to that. Um, and Lindsay Lodi, our magnificent media fellow. <laughs> and Lindsay, Lindsay, without whom none of this would be possible. We are so grateful. Last but by no means least, I'm delighted to introduce Professor Stephen Blythe, uh, PhD, G GSAS PhD in Statistics from 1992 and Professor of the Practice in Statistics. Um, Stephen established a Dean's Innovation Fund that supports Horizon, Harvard Horizons. And I have a challenge for Stephen. We've agreed. I think he's going to do something worse to me. But my challenge to Stephen is to say, repeat after me, Harvard Horizons is awesome and see if he has as much trouble with the last word as I do. So, <laughs> Professor Stephen Blythe. Well, thank you, Emma, and uh, uh, welcome, everybody. I'm delighted to, to welcome you here for HH6, this great occasion. Uh, and to help celebrate and showcase uh, the graduate school here at Harvard and the talent of its, its students. Harvard Horizons is brilliant. And um, uh, in fact, when, uh, when Emma and I were, grow were children uh, growing up in, in England, um, not together, I should say, but, uh, and uh, our dean was uh, on, the, on the big screen, I, I never imagined I'd be able to say, I have followed Emma Dench onto the stage. <laughs> and now I can. So that's, uh, that's great. As, as uh, Emma mentioned, uh, the driving force, or one of the driving forces behind the establishment of Horizons back in 2012, 2013, uh, is Zhao Li Meng, uh, uh, Emma's predecessor as dean of the, the graduate school, and also a, a colleague of mine in the statistics department, both as a student uh, 30 years ago and as a faculty member uh, now. Um, that did mean that we were starting the Harvard Horizon shows with two statisticians on stage, and um, some people thought that was perhaps one too many. Um, I don't know why. Now I'm pleased to say we're starting the show with two Brits on stage, and I think you can never have too many Brits uh, on stage for the Horizons. Um, so Emma, Jali, and I uh, all 
uh, feel strongly about the importance of, of good communication, in particular the ability to convey complex ideas in a clear and coherent and convincing and, and compelling way. And that, that ability is so important in academia and is also uh, even more important perhaps in careers outside the academy. Uh, firms hire our PhD students to uh, develop groundbreaking ideas, but they also want our graduates to be able to articulate the, the impact and relevance of their research to their colleagues. And in my own uh, career, I've seen many talented, very smart PhD students flounder uh, simply because of the inability to communicate. So I'm just delighted that Harvard Horizons uh, really supports that idea of, of communication. Uh, the three of us also feel very strongly about providing for our students within JSAS the stage from which they can bring their groundbreaking and spectacular ideas to a broader audience. This is the stage. You are the broader audience. These are our talented students. Thank you again for being here. I hope I'll see you next year for HH7. Uh, but for now, enjoy the show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Stephen. He didn't take my challenge. <laughs> Can't believe it. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to continue in, in the vein I, I, uh, I, I set up, and I'm going to continue until Stephen takes up my challenge. Um, Harvard Horizons is an awesome program. And as such, Harvard Horizon has awesome alumni. Um, I'm delighted that we're joined by two of our awesome Harvard Horizons alumni um, who are going to introduce our magnificent eight Harvard Horizons scholars. So please give a big warm welcome to Sharice Barron from 2016 and David Robeson from 2014. Well, hello, David. Hello, Sharice. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I'm feeling brilliantly awesome right now. How yes. about you? It's an awesome program, Horizons. It if you absolutely didn't know. is. <laughs> Welcome once again to the 2018 Harvard Horizons Symposium. We have been charged with introducing the speakers tonight, but before we do, we want to share with you a bit of what makes Harvard Horizons so special and impactful for those who participate in the program. Yeah, when I came to Harvard, I was fully expecting to have a stellar academic experience with world-class professors and peers, but I wasn't aware of all the professional development opportunities such as the Horizons program that Harvard offers. And in my position as a co-founder and, and chief operating officer at Blue Therapeutics, a startup pharmaceutical company, it's these professional development uh, skills that I picked up have arguably been as, as valuable to me as the academic learnings that I had. Um, the, the, the Horizons program taught me, as it has taught all of these that you'll see here today, to communicate my science in a way that can be uh, digested and, and understood by a broad audience. And this has helped not only in, uh, in, in, in my communication on the stage and in and, and face to face, but with things such as small business grants, which funded my company and got it off the ground, and in, in raising funds with investors, all of these things I can tie back to my, my training and my six weeks of, of intense uh, feedback and, and learning uh, in this program. Um, beyond that, the interaction with uh, peers in, in graduate school from across different disciplines was also a very valuable experience that's continued to provide benefit to me. Uh, so after last year's symposium, I was talking with one of the 2017 scholars, Shane Neufeld, about his work in data science. And he was, I was telling a bit, him a bit about my pharmaceutical startup, and he was telling me a bit about his machine learning work. And uh, long story short, we're now, we've started a collaboration and uh, another startup that is applying machine learning to uh, advanced drug development. 
Well, I have remained in academia since my graduation from Harvard in May of 2017. I am currently a postdoctoral associate and lecturer in ethnomusicology at the Yale Institute of Sacred Music. And I'm constantly using what I gained from Harvard Horizons. I'm able to succinctly explain to my students and my colleagues about my work, but also I always have the best slides. <laughs> so Harvard Horizons is about six weeks worth of training in speaking and communicating about your research, but the benefits last for years and years and years throughout one's career. So with that being said, we would like to introduce to you the 2018 cohort of Harvard Horizon Scholars. If you would please stand. We have Adam Tanaka. Christy Chu. Eric Fredrickson. Wendy Salkin. Justin Stern. Marie Christine Nietzsche. Lu Xuan Tong. And Argiro Nicolau. The 2018 Horizon Scholars. Imagine you're moving to a new city. You've just got a new job, and you're looking for a place to live. But everything you find is above your paycheck. Would you move in with five strangers? Pay half your income in rent for a broom closet? Or would you consider moving to a place like this? This is Co-op City in New York, America's largest affordable housing development. And although its architecture might look like low-income public housing, it's actually a subsidized middle-class cooperative. Believe it or not, 60,000 people call this complex home. For decades, policymakers, planners, and much of the general public have dismissed places that look like Co-op City as social and architectural failures, as housing of last resort. In my research in filmmaking, I propose the opposite, that Co-op City and other developments like it provide a template for the future of the American city. After all, despite its austere architecture, Co-op City is safe and well-maintained with shops and schools on site. If you earn between $25,000 and $65,000 a year, you can purchase a spacious one bedroom here for just $14,000. As you can imagine, the wait list is pretty long. With so many of our major urban centers increasingly divide between, uh, divided between rich and poor, middle income projects like Co-op City have much to teach us. In fact, we need to ask ourselves, how can we build places like Co-op City again? In my dissertation, I explore the rise and fall of New York's post-war experiment with large-scale middle-income housing. While most middle-class Americans were busy moving to the suburbs, New York charted a different course, subsidizing private developers to build massive housing complexes for the city's workforce, for teachers and nurses, factory workers and police officers, and yes, professors too. To this day, you can find one of these middle-income developments in almost every corner of New York City. Across the rest of the country, subsidized departments soon became associated with concentrated poverty. But in New York, strong labor unions, a powerful tenant movement, and sustained demand for city living 
pushed city leaders to embrace a more expansive vision of mass housing. This was a vision that blurred the lines between public housing and the private market, as shown in this promotional video for Co-op City from the early 1970s. The goal of these projects was to house the so-called forgotten families who earned too much to qualify for low-income housing, but too little to rent or purchase on the private market. A parallel goal was to keep these families and their tax dollars in city limits in an age of suburbanization. Initially, middle-income projects predominantly served white families. But in the context of the civil rights era, several of New York's largest middle-income developments, including Co-op City, became pioneering experiments in racial integration, with different races and ethnicities living side by side in pointed contrast to the suburbs. At the time, the federal government backed suburban growth and offered little support for urban middle-class housing. As a result, New York was forced to develop its own specialized housing programs that leaned heavily on private partners. Indeed, while most scholars have emphasized the central role of government and labor unions in devising New York's uniquely generous post-war housing programs, I argue the reverse, that New York's liberal leaders, far from undercutting the capitalist housing market, opened up new opportunities for private profit in the middle income tier. And it was precisely this partnership that enabled the city to develop such an expansive program of affordable housing. Some middle-income projects, most notably Co-op City, were developed by labor unions committed to the notion of a non-speculative housing market. But the majority were built by for-profit developers who used these programs exactly as they were intended, to build rent-restricted housing, often for a limited time period, in exchange for public subsidies. Just two notable examples. MetLife Insurance Company, at the time New York's largest private employer, invested in the massive Stuyvesant Town Complex in Lower Manhattan. And Fred Trump, one of Brooklyn's biggest developers, built the enormous Trump Village in Coney Island. The city's middle-income strategy did not last. By the mid-1970s, with the city suffering from depopulation and economic decline, the motivations for middle-income development evaporated. Fast forward 50 years, however, and the situation has changed dramatically. In the context of a surging real estate market, these projects now play a key role shoring up the city's economic diversity. Unfortunately, those same pressures are also pushing some landlords to convert their properties to market rates. Some are even being branded today as luxury apartments. The loss of these affordable units is no surprise. From early on, these programs incorporated privatization clauses, enabling developers to exit affordability under certain conditions. Without these incentives, it is doubtful whether developers like Trump or MetLife would have built them in the first place. A major challenge facing policymakers today is to develop more robust subsidy mechanisms to incentivize landlords to maintain affordability in the longer term. Today, New York's population is growing rapidly. It's also growing increasingly unequal. Over the past 15 years, while the city's population grew by 7%, its number of middle-income households, those earning between $40,000 and $100,000 a year, actually shrank by 3%. Meanwhile, almost a third of the city's middle-income renters are rent-burdened, meaning that they pay more than 30% of their pre-tax income towards rent. These are the sorts of people that make a city work. Teachers, nurses, police officers, artists, immigrant entrepreneurs. And these are exactly the sorts of people that projects like Co-op City continue to cater to. So how might we move forward? And what might we learn from the past? Think about who built the last generation of middle-income housing. Labor unions, major employers, and real estate developers. These actors are heavily, if not exclusively, invested in city life. They all have a stake in housing the workforce that will sustain urban economic growth in the longer term. And with the federal government missing in action once more, state and local governments will have to lean heavily on private partners. So who has an interest in housing the workforce in our nation's priciest cities? While the history is unique to New York, I think these lessons apply to the other cities around the country that are struggling with skyrocketing housing costs. 
whether partnering with universities, hospitals, or pharmaceutical companies in Boston, or the tech sector in the Bay Area, we must forge a new consensus to housing the middle class and securing a fairer future. Thank you very much. Physics allows us to engineer our world. Sometimes the physics is intuitive to us because we all experience it so much, like how sound travels in a room. And we can engineer theaters like this one with amazing acoustics. Sometimes the physics isn't intuitive, so we have to understand it completely before we can apply it but the applications can be incredible. For example, all of modern electronics exist because physicists figured out the quantum mechanics of a class of materials called semiconductors. There's another highly promising class of materials whose properties are also based in quantum mechanics. We call them strongly correlated materials. The most notable of these is the high temperature superconductor, which can channel electricity without energy loss. Because of this, high temperature superconductors could revolutionize modern electronics, leading to higher efficiency power lines, smaller and more powerful motors, and improved MRI machines for medicine. But today, even the best high temperature superconductors currently discovered require temperatures below minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit to function. And direct study and computation, although standard approaches in physics, haven't yet provided a complete description of where these properties come from. So we haven't been able to engineer a material with these properties at room temperature. My lab is implementing a new approach, building a physical model, that is, building a separate physical system which is a direct analogy to these materials. It's just like how car safety tests will use a crash test dummy as a direct analogy to human beings to understand the impact of a car crash on humans without having to understand all the forces at play. Now, to understand our model, first we must understand what is the basic structure of materials and what makes strongly correlated materials unique? Well, every material is made up of atoms. If these atoms are arranged in a crystalline grid, then the most loosely bound electrons can break free from their parent atoms and move around the material. To these electrons, the atoms provide a landscape of hills and valleys. The electrons tend to stay in the valleys near their parent electron, uh, atoms, but can still move around and repel other electrons. Crucially though, the electrons are also quantum mechanical, which for us means two main things. First, they don't move between definite locations. They're actually smeared out over many locations, and the probabilities of where you might find them are what moves between the valleys. Second, they follow additional rules. For example, no more than two electrons can sit at the same valley. In strongly correlated materials, these effects give rise to the complex behavior from which they get their name, where each electron is strongly correlated with nearby electrons. This complex behavior is what we want to understand with our physical model. The beauty of our model is that we can use other quantum particles to play the part of the electron. We use atoms, lithium atoms to be exact. These atoms are 10,000 times larger than electrons. And by placing them 10,000 times farther apart from each other than electrons in a material, we make them far easier to control and measure. But this also means that to see the same degree of quantum behavior, we actually have to lower their energies by a factor of over 100 billion. So we built a machine to achieve these astonishingly low energies. 
This machine uses hundreds of lenses, mirrors, fibers, and other optical elements to very precisely control lasers, which in turn very precisely control the atoms. For example, they can slow atoms down and remove energy, much like a beam of ping pong balls can slow down a rolling bowling ball. With lasers, we can also create a grid of high intensity points of light. And in doing so, we recreate the landscape that electrons in a material see. Less light gives us a shallow landscape where it's very easy for the electrons to move around, while more light can give us a deep landscape to restrict atom movement. In fact, by changing the overall intensity of light and the number of atoms in our model, we can change the type of material we study. And then if we rapidly snap on our lasers to maximum power, we can freeze all atoms in their tracks and pin them in place. We can then take a high resolution picture of where they all are to read out information from our model. Here's one image that I took, a raw picture straight from my experiment. Each of these blue dots is an atom, and they're all sitting perfectly within our grid. Now, patterns within these pictures tell us how our atoms behave. The presence of certain patterns have confirmed that we can make our atoms behave as electrons do in familiar materials, such as metals or insulators. The presence of another pattern was the signature that we could make our atoms behave as electrons do in one type of strongly correlated material called the antiferromagnet. With our model, our current goal is to use these patterns to complete the profile of the high temperature superconductor, to learn how the electrons within arrange themselves to channel electricity without losing energy as heat. And while we may be able to contribute to a new wave of technology in this way, to me, our model is more than just the path to understanding these materials. These models are one way to harness the complexity of quantum mechanics, to solve problems and learn something that existing methods cannot teach us. And I think it'll be the first of many. Thank you. For over two billion people in the world today, the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, is sacred scripture. For hundreds of scholars across the globe, it is an invaluable window on an ancient culture from which few other voices remain. Although we sometimes think of the Bible as a single book, it's more like a library, consisting of many texts written at various times and in various places. Any attempt to understand the meaning of these texts or the histories and cultures they reflect inevitably encounters one important question. When were these texts written? After centuries of study, scholars are more divided than ever. These differences in date affect the way we read these texts. Take, for example, the famous story of Joseph and his brothers. Joseph is his father's favorite son, and his brothers are jealous of his status. Overcome by their hatred for him, they have him sent to Egypt as a slave and tell their father he is dead. When these brothers unexpectedly reunite with Joseph in Egypt, he is now the highest official in the Egyptian royal court, and it's because of him that they escape a famine. According to one scholarly view, this story was composed in the northernmost of two rival kingdoms. In this northern kingdom, there were tribes that traced their ancestry to Joseph, and the kingdom itself was often called the House of Joseph. So by telling a story in which Joseph is chosen over his brothers, the story is implying that this northern kingdom has the right to rule over its southern neighbor, where they traced their ancestry primarily to Judah, one of, Ju one of Joseph's brothers. 
But this view clearly only makes sense if the story was composed while the Northern Kingdom existed. That is between, at the earliest, 930 BCE, and at the latest, 720. Other interpretations of this story also depend on the dates, and all told, the differences among scholars on the date of this story exceed 700 years. As a scholar of the Hebrew Bible, I'm fascinated with these differences in date and their implications. And working together with colleagues, I've developed a new approach to the question, a statistical and computational method that uses language to date ancient texts. For my project, I apply the method to Hebrew, which is the language of these texts. But the method itself does not depend upon the language. So I'll begin with a few examples in English to make the basics clear. Let's suppose you go searching through an archive of English texts, and you find several that have no date attached, and you want to determine it. You know that all the texts in the archive are from sometime between 1800 and the present, but nothing more. To determine the date using the language, you would gather other texts for which you know the date, and you would compare that with the frequency of different words within those texts. And you would aim to identify changes in the language over time. Some of the cases that you would encounter would be simple, and the conclusions that follow would be obvious, without any need for a statistical or computational approach. Let's suppose you found a novel that contained the word iPhone, with a capital P. As you examine the words from 1800 and work your way toward the present, you would find almost no examples of the term until there's a sudden spike in usage right around 2007. With such clear differences over time, there would be almost no question that this novel was written sometime between 2007 and the present. Other cases, however, would be a bit more difficult to handle. Suppose you found a, wor uh, a short story that contained the old-fashioned word thou. It would be clear from your evidence that the frequency decreased over time, but the word is still used even today, so there's additional uncertainty that needs to be taken into account. And further, to fully take advantage of this evidence, you would need to begin calculating rates of change. As you proceed, you attempt to combine both pieces of evidence together, gathering for each text whether it contains the word iPhone, whether it contains the word thou, and how often. And now the problem must be represented in three dimensions. Each additional term adds yet more dimensions. In fact, these are only two of many possible terms that could have changed over time, so if we want to get the best dates, we have to search over all of the terms in all of the novels. And not only this, but many combinations of the many terms to find the one that will best predict the date. And now the problem has become extremely complex. When we now go to date text in the Hebrew Bible, we have all of these same complicating factors, but to them we add one more. If these were English texts, we could match a frequency of a particular word with a particular date. But for Hebrew texts, we instead have only a range of dates. We know that each text was written before some date and after another, but little more. And every year between these maximum and minimum dates must be taken into account. This means that in order to determine the change of even one word, we must take into account all of the combinations of all of the possible years across all of the books. And when we combine this with the other complications we already saw, we now have a dizzying array of possibilities to consider. Simply stated, no human scholar could ever take all of this in at once. It's no wonder, then, that scholars arrive at such vastly different dates. But in our method, each aspect of the complexity becomes a separate part of a concise mathematical expression, and all of these issues can be simultaneously taken into account. The results, so far, are surprising. One of the main conclusions among scholars who had examined the language before was that many texts in the Hebrew Bible were written before 600 BCE. But our initial results suggest that these same texts were written after that date, and among those texts is the Joseph story. Now, some might think that the use of a quantitative method should settle the issue of dates once and for all, but I think of it differently. The conclusions in these methods are meant to be updated, 
At any given point, we can assess the accuracy of our method using the resources of the method itself. But the goal will always be to improve that accuracy ever more over time by including more evidence, improving our statistical techniques, and continuing the dialogue. Taken separately, both humanistic and quantitative approaches have their own respective strengths. But if we can bring them together, then we can shed new light on some very old questions. Who speaks for you? Some commonplace answers may come to mind. Your lawyer speaks for you in court. Your senator speaks for you in the Senate. Your healthcare proxy may come to speak for you should you lose capacity. They are your formal representatives. They are chosen by you or by a group of which you are a member to speak for you. The process by which they are chosen is a formal, corporately organized, legally sanctioned election or selection mechanism. But if this is all that we think representation is, we are missing out. What about the leaders of social movements, like the students of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida? Not elected, but they have come to be viewed by a wide variety of audiences as the representatives for K through 12 American students on the issue of gun control in this country. Or consider Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who sat down to negotiate with President Lyndon Johnson on behalf of black Americans lobbying for civil rights legislation. We have a tendency to overlook one of the most widespread and least well understood forms of political representation, informal political representation. And so in my work as a moral and political philosopher, I provide a novel account of this phenomenon. But what is an informal political representative? Well, an informal political representative is someone who is not been elected or selected by means of a formal, corporately organized election or selection mechanism. So, no going to the polls to vote, no formal appointment by a judge. Call this the informality condition. But then you may ask, how is the informal representative selected? And the answer is audience uptake. A person emerges as an informal representative when and because they have come to be taken by an audience to speak or act on behalf of a group. And that audience can be just about anyone. It could be the crowd at a political rally or your Twitter followers. It might be the president of the United States or even Stephen Colbert. Someone takes you to be speaking or acting on behalf of a represented group, and that's all it takes for you to emerge as an informal representative for that group. And because it is the audience who, in effect, chooses our informal representatives, we can end up with informal representatives we would not choose but cannot shake. Consider, for instance, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. In 2015, when critiquing the United States nuclear deal with Iran, Prime Minister Netanyahu described himself as the emissary of the entire Jewish people. In response, Senator Dianne Feinstein said, no, he doesn't speak for me on this. I think the Jewish community is like any other community. There are different points of view. So too, might a representative feel that they are stuck with us? Think of ta Coates, who has lamented his emergence into the position of informal representative for black Americans. There is, he says, an unfortunate tradition in this dialogue of quote unquote race relations in this country, where people are selected at various moments to be spokespeople for what is right now a community of 40 million people. He continues, obviously I write and I write for the public, and I want my thoughts considered. I want my writing considered. But I didn't ask for a crown. 
Though sometimes disconcerting for those who find themselves thrust into the position of informal political representative, informal representation can be crucial for many, particularly the members of marginalized and oppressed groups whose voices may go unheard in more traditional political fora. Informal political representation can change the very course and structure of our lives. An informal representative is often uniquely situated to bring visibility to a marginalized or oppressed group, to make demands on behalf of that group to the government, say. But an informal representative can also be uniquely situated to harm or even wrong the members of a represented group, as they have outsized power to influence how a broader public views the members of that group and its values, interests, preferences, and desires. And so there is a tension at the very heart of informal political representation. There is, on the one hand, a need, sometimes desperate for this representation, and on the other hand, there can be a danger built into the practice, unmoored as it is from the more traditional protections available in those formal contexts. And so, in the absence of these traditional authorization and accountability mechanisms, we are in need of an account of the ethics of informal political representation. And that is precisely what I offer. When a person emerges as an informal political representative for a marginalized or oppressed group, that representative has a responsibility to promote conditions of social equality for the members of that group. Now, this requirement has two aspects democracy within, and justice without. The democracy within duties are the duties that the representative has in their immediate relationship to the represented group. The representative is responsible to forge a democratic relationship with the members of that group by promoting certain basic rights and interpersonal commitments in that relationship. The representative should, among other things, treat the represented as their equals, respect the represented, not suppress dissent from the represented, and be transparent with the represented. So too, does the representative have justice without duties? Now these are the duties that concern how the representative ought to comport themselves when they are standing before an audience speaking on behalf of the represented group. Now, if the foregoing strikes you as intuitively plausible or even obvious, all the better. Our aim in constructing a moral theory is not to shock or surprise, though a theory may in fact shock or surprise you. Rather, our aim is to think carefully and seriously about the relationships in which we stand to one another and to try to understand what it is we owe one another on the basis of those relationships. And so, once more, I want to ask you this. Who speaks for you and what would you expect of them? Thank you. In my time at Harvard, and before that as a practicing urban planner, I've been interested in how economic and technological transformations affect the form and function of cities. For the last five years, I've been exploring these issues in the Philippines, and I want to take you on a journey there today. I first visited the Philippines in 2013 on a research trip to study housing in Manila. After nearly 22 hours of flying from Boston, I arrived jet-lagged, really, really jet-lagged, and I went to bed in the late afternoon. I woke up the following morning at 2 a.m. It was a Wednesday, and I was wide awake. Rather than lie in bed and try to fall back asleep or count sheep, I decided to go out for a walk. Now, naturally, I was expecting the city to be quiet and deserted, for a moment, I wondered if it might be unsafe to go out at such an early hour. But what I encountered when I left the hotel was something completely unexpected. As you can see, the city was bustling at 2 a.m. There were people out talking with their friends and eating at streetside cafes. There weren't just adults, but children too, entire families. There was a market that was open throughout the early morning hours. And at 4 a.m. and 5 a.m., the line at Starbucks and Jollibee and McDonald's was out the door. There was a traffic jam in front of my hotel at 4 a.m. And I even came across a sign for Applebee's advertising not one, but two happy hours, one at seven at night 
and the other at 6 in the morning. Imagine that. Boneless buffalo wings and frozen margaritas at 6 in the morning. I was perplexed when I left the hotel. I had no idea what was going on. For a second, I thought maybe I set my watch incorrectly after landing. It felt more like 7 or 8 at night. So I went up to a group of people eating outside and asked them for the time. 2 a.m. My watch was correct. I turned back to them. I was really confused. I said, excuse me, but why are so many people eating dinner at 2 a.m.? Is it a holiday? Did a concert get out? What, what's going on? And they all laughed, turned back to me, and said, we're not having dinner. We're having lunch. We're on our lunch break. We work on American time. That's our office up there. And they pointed to this building, which at the top had the very familiar logo of Dell Computers. And that's when everything started to click. I have a question for the audience. Who here has placed a phone call to a bank, an airline, a computer manufacturer like Dell, and suspected that the person on the other end of the line was in another country? OK, almost everybody. Can't see all of you. Uh, this is a pretty common experience if you live in the United States, if you live in Australia, Europe, Canada. This practice is called business process outsourcing, or BPO. And customer service call centers are one subsector of this industry. It just so happened that I had booked a hotel room in an area called Eastwood City, which is one of the largest hubs for the call center industry. The Philippines is 12 hours ahead of Eastern Standard Time in the United States, and the US is by far the largest market served in the Philippines outsourcing industry. The most common work shift is from nine at night to six in the morning. And for this reason, areas like Eastwood City and dozens of other development projects that cater to the outsourcing sector function primarily at night. They're most active at night. The Philippines has replaced India as the call center capital of the world. 25 years ago, it was expensive and rather unreliable to route a significant volume of calls from the United States to the Philippines. Today, this is the fastest growing industry in the Philippines. It accounts for over $23 billion in revenue annually and has brought over a million jobs to the country. In contrast to other scholars who have looked at the growth of this industry from an economic or an anthropological perspective, I'm interested in how the outsourcing industry is changing cities and city planning practice. For the last few years, I've been mapping the geographic distribution of call centers and their temporal and infrastructural asymmetries. I've been interviewing politicians, business executives, urban planners, and of course, call center agents. And I've been mapping the growth dynamics of call center industries. What I'm finding is striking, and I want to share a few takeaways with you today. The first involves the construction of new office space. Over the last few years, hundreds of thousands of square feet of new office space have been constructed across the Philippines, catering primarily to the BPO industry. You see, it's very difficult to open a call center in an existing office building. One of the most important requirements is a large floor plate on which hundreds, if not over 1,000 employees can be assembled on a single floor. This example of a typical floor plan gives you a sense of the density in the arrangement of employees. In many cases, it would be difficult, if not impossible, to convert this office building to other uses, to traditional office uses. Now, these call centers are typically located in special economic zones known as IT centers, and they receive a variety of tax incentives in doing so. What's interesting about these IT centers is that they tend to be located in central urban areas and adjacent to a variety of other uses. This, for example, is the Venetian Grand Canal project in the city of Taguig in Metro Manila. It includes a large shopping mall and restaurants. There's even a canal through the property where you can ride a gondola. There's a condominium, a hotel, a vocational school, and call centers, dozens of call centers that anchor the project but are not the only aspect of the project. The growth of the industry is also creating unusual challenges for public transportation. In particular, how do hundreds of thousands of people commute to and from work outside of normal business hours? I've been mapping the changes to formal and informal transportation networks, and I've also been surveying people who work on a night shift. I found that people working in the BPO industry typically spend between three and four hours in traffic every single day. And security is also a concern. In one city I visited, the mayor told me that with 50,000 people working at night in his city in call centers, there's been an increase in crime. The city has responded by installing thousands of streetlights around urban areas and by changing the shift of the police force. And they're still grappling with this issue and searching for solutions. 
And although these call centers are typically located in large private corporate estates, their characteristics also seep into the adjacent urban areas. The local barangays, these uh, images are from the barangays of South Sembo and Bagumbayan, where many long-term residents are beginning to change their sleep schedule, business owners are operating more in the evening, and many call center agents and people working in the BPO industry, tired of their long commutes, are looking for housing in bed space. What's happening in the Philippines today is one example of the local implications of global capitalism and global outsourcing. It's also an example of how new technologies, in this case cheap digital communications around the world, have unintended consequences on the form of cities and social practices within cities. In the case of the Philippines, entire urban areas synchronized to a foreign time zone, often to our time zone, in, in the process disrupting the cultural rhythm of the nation. As these maps demonstrate, offices that service particular time zones tend to co-locate near one another. They cluster in particular parts of the city. I refer to this in my writing as the temporal logic of agglomeration. I'd like to conclude, however, on a more speculative note, one about how we design cities today. Nobody knows how long Dell Computers or any other corporation will be routing customer service calls from the United States to the Philippines. However, many analysts suggest that in just the next few years, a significant number of these jobs will be, re will be replaced by artificial intelligence and voice automated technology. This is particularly concerning considering the number of people working in the industry and also considering the extent to which urban environments are being restructured to accommodate this industry's growth. The key question then, which I address in my dissertation, is how do we imagine a kind of urban planning that is responsive to more than just one economic cycle? A kind of planning that is adaptive and resilient to the ever-increasing pace of economic and technological transformation around the world today. Thank you. What makes you, you? What are these core elements without which you would no longer recognize yourself? It could be that you're an athlete. You're a quick learner. What if these things were taken away from you? It could be a stroke or Alzheimer's disease wiping out most of your memories. How do these illnesses impact our sense of self? Before it's a concept and the topic of a dissertation, the self is an experience for each and every one of us. We all have an intimate sense of what it's like to be us. And yet, for centuries, the self has been largely ignored by scientists because of its subjectivity. So can there be a science of the self? Can we build an objective, measurable account of this very subjective, individual experience? In pursuit of this question, I've done a PhD in philosophy and then another one in neuropsychology. This interdisciplinary approach gives me a unique angle, one in which our theory of the self is directly relevant to patients' lives. In 2007, I met Michael, Michael had a stroke. From the outside, he seems to be in a vegetative state. For years, we didn't even know he was conscious. But the location of his lesion, right under his brain, left his brain largely intact, if unable to communicate with the rest of his body. Michael suffers from a condition called the locked-in syndrome. He lives in a wheelchair, unable to move by himself, or speak to his loved ones. If you had such a stroke, would you still be you? The way we answer this question matters because it shapes the medical decisions, sometimes life or death, that we, as families or healthcare providers, make for these patients. And the way we've answered this question so far has been by projecting what we perceive from the outside, so to speak, from the armchair. Instead, I argue that in order to understand the impact of these strokes on these people's sense of self, 
we needed to shift our perspective to that of the patient, from the armchair to the wheelchair. But asking Michael is difficult. We have to use his brain activity. The brain of healthy people, as much as that of patients, activates in similar manners when we think about the same things. We can use this as a communication code to ask these patients how this stroke has impacted their sense of self. First, I asked doctors, and two-thirds of them told me, no, they won't feel like themselves. The extent of the objective damage is just too great. And then I asked 44 patients just like Michael, and two-thirds of them told me, yeah, it's still me. Objectively, there's been a lot of change, but subjectively, it still feels like me. 15 million people in the world have a stroke every year. It is the leading cause of paralysis. And in order to improve the medical decisions we make for the care of these patients, it is important that we shift our perspective and account better for their subjective experience. But we wouldn't be able to do so without the proper tools. And because the self has been largely kept outside of scientific inquiry for so long, my first task has been to create such tools. The same year I met Michael, artist William Uttermolen died in London with Alzheimer's disease, leaving behind this famous series of self-portraits. At the time, most neuroscientists believed that patients with Alzheimer's disease undergo a progressive and eventually complete loss of self. As they lose their memories, the way they see themselves changes. But do they lose their sense of self? Meet Maria. Maria is an 86-year-old lady who suffers from Alzheimer's disease. I meet her during one of my first clinical rotations in a geriatric unit. Every night around 5 p.m., Maria becomes agitated and tries leaving the hospital. The existing tools quantify precisely for the doctors how much of her memory Maria has lost. She no longer remembers having been married, having had children, let alone grandchildren. She appears delusional, speaking of dead people, and the medical team is considering restraining her. Instead of focusing on what has been lost, I developed a tool that aims at assessing how much of herself might still be preserved. And using this tool, I asked Maria to describe herself in her own words for two minutes. And for the first time, Maria says she's a teenage girl and she needs to go now because her mama wants her home before it gets dark out. It's the winter, it gets dark around 5 p.m. every night. Maria has a sense of self. It no longer matches the 86-year-old face we see, but it matches the subjective memories she still has. Creating these tools allow us to meet the patients where they're at, to adjust their care accordingly, and to explain to their families what is going on. And now that we have these tools, we can investigate how the self relates to other important health outcomes. Survivors of sexual assault are five times more likely to die by suicide than others. Using one of the scales I developed to assess their subjective experience of their self, we can predict better than the current gold standard in the field who is at risk for these self-destructive behaviors. And we found similar results among US veterans with combat experience. Together, these results have led me to ask to another population what their experience would be like. And in my latest work, I have researched how a face transplant would impact the experience of a self. Since the world premiere in 2005, there have been 38 face transplants in the world. And the first person to have had two face transplants after the first one got rejected was announced just a few weeks ago. These tools allow us to characterize the impact of this life-changing surgery on these patients' selves 
and to help them adjust and recognize themselves in their new face. All told, my research has demonstrated that it is possible to create objective, reliable, scientific measures to assess the most subjective experience of ourself, and that these tools yield important, clinically relevant results for the care of patients with a history of stroke, Alzheimer's disease, sexual assault, combat, or face transplant. But when you think about it, every patient who comes to a hospital is facing a situation that challenges their sense of self. And yet no hospital currently has a program geared to help these patients with this specific aspect of their experience in illness. My next step is to create a hospital-based program harnessing the strength of these tools to help our patients face the change the illness is bringing in their lives and allow them to recognize themselves once more. Thank you. This is a typical hazy day in Beijing. However, this is not the first time the humans have seen it. New Delhi is experiencing it, Los Angeles has seen it, and you probably have heard about the Great Smog of London. It seems inevitable for humans to pollute the nature in the process of economic growth. But does it have to be the case? The greatest challenge facing humanity this century, I'm convinced, is finding the energy to power a civilization of seven billion people without detrimental consequences to the environment. And I believe renewable energy is front and center in that challenge. The problem with renewable energy is that the supply and demand are not synchronized. For example, here's a profile of wind power over 20 days. As you can see, there are windy days and calm days. And at the same time, human demand follow more of a periodic and regular trend. And obviously, they don't overlap very well. Similarly, for solar, the pattern does not overlap very well with human activities. So this unbalanced supply and demand problem is a major barrier to a wider adoption of renewable energies. So what do we do? And the problem is the electricity price, just like all other commodities, is governed by supply and demand. When renewable energy electricity generation exceeds human demand, like extreme sunny or windy days, the electricity price will actually turn negative, meaning that the utility company is actually paying the customers to use the electricity. Obviously, this is not a healthy market, and it's one of the reasons that utility companies are not investing much in the renewable energy. So to solve this unbalanced supply and demand problem, battery storage is the key. But when people usually talk about batteries, they usually mean lithium-ion batteries. Lithium-ion batteries are great, but they're expensive, and they're not really scalable, meaning that they're not really suitable for grid-scale energy storage. They can also be flammable and even explosive. What I've been working on is a new type of battery called flow battery. Flow battery works by storing liquid electrolyte in external tanks. This way, you can arbitrarily scale up or down the size depending on your desired applications, such as storing powers for hospitals or universities. The pumps here are used to, to flow liquid electrolyte through adjacent half cells separated by this ion exchange membrane. Flow battery is not really a new concept. Traditionally, flow battery employ an inorganic metal ion called vanadium as an electrolyte, and this is what they usually look like in reality. The problem with vanadium is that vanadiums are toxic and they're expensive. More importantly, there is simply not enough vanadium on Earth to support a worldwide energy storage. So I am trained as an organic chemist. So instead of inorganic metal ion, I turn my focus into organic molecules. More specifically, a class of organic molecules called quinones. 
You may not have noticed, but quinones actually exist everywhere. They're in our dietary supplements. They participate in photosynthesis. They're even responsible for the brownings of apples. So the common roles of quinones in this seemingly unrelated three examples are that quinones store and release electrons in those processes. And that's exactly what we want in a battery, storing and releasing electrons. So inspired by nature, I took the core of these quinone molecules and chemically synthesized several derivatives. One promising candidate stands out, dihydroxybenzoquinone. This molecule is cheap and is highly water soluble. When I paired this molecule up with iron, I was able to assemble a flow battery with a performance comparable to some of the traditional flow, vanadium flow batteries, but much, much cheaper and safer. One important advantage of using organic molecules instead of inorganic metal ions is that the structures of organic molecules can be modified and the properties can be fine-tuned. Just like adding pieces to a Lego toy, but through chemical synthesis, I was able to add different functional groups onto the molecule to increase its solubility, to improve its stability, or to improve the overall battery voltage. By employing chemical modification, for example, I was able to increase the battery lifetime by more than tenfold. So I've shown you the example of using dihydroxybenzoquinone, and that's a project I've been working on. But more importantly, I want to convey to you the idea of using organic molecules in general as energy storage. My group and I have worked on many different class of organic molecules, including benzoquinone we just talked about, We've also worked on anthroquinones and other types of quinones. We've also worked on a class of organic molecules called flavins, which is actually a type of vitamins in our body. And obviously, there are more and more other types of organic molecules waiting to be explored, and we are only limited by our imagination. So I want to conclude with a famous quote from former oil minister of Saudi Arabia, Sheikh Yamani. The stone age did not end for a lack of stone. An oil age will end long before the world runs out of oil. We are in the time of change, witnessing a gradual shift from fossil fuels to renewable energy. And today, I'm excited to share with you my contribution to a greener and more sustainable future. Thank you. In the past three years, more than 10,000 people lost their lives trying to cross the Mediterranean Sea to get to Europe. No longer just the cradle of civilization or a sunny tourist destination, the Mediterranean has become the symbol of Europe's moral and political dilemmas. The Mediterranean Sea, after all, has long been the geographical embodiment of a paradox at the heart of Europe. On the one hand, Europe strives to separate itself from its eastern and southern Mediterranean neighbors by treating the sea as a border. On the other hand, Europe relies on locations and cultures in the Mediterranean for much of what it calls its cultural heritage. In today's increasingly xenophobic political climate, then, it is easy to forget that the Mediterranean and Mediterranean migrations are part and parcel of Europe's history and identity. The story of migration is as old as the story of Europe itself. Take the case of Europa, Europe's mythological counterpart and the origins of the continent's name. Europa, a princess from ancient Phoenicia in modern-day Lebanon and Syria, was abducted from her homeland by the god Zeus. Zeus forcibly carried Europa across the eastern Mediterranean to the island of Crete, where she gave birth to Minos, the founder of one of the oldest European civilizations. So Europa was not European to begin with. It was her displacement, by which I mean her movement from her homeland to somewhere else, that created Europe. 
So what can Europa's story and others like hers teach us about the way we talk and debate about the current refugee crisis in Europe today? As a scholar of literature and a filmmaker, I'm interested in the ways in which Mediterranean migrations are represented in literature, film, and visual art, including how migrants represent themselves. Artistic expressions have the advantage of communicating the experience of displacement beyond the facts alone. They offer thoughts, metaphors, dreams, frustrations, and hopes. One of the key findings of my research is that the first-hand experience of displacement has a direct effect on both the content and the form of these creative works. This is significant because stories and other works of art are some of the main vehicles through which we come to know ourselves, our communities, and the wider world. My dissertation examines a selection of creative works about events of forced Mediterranean migration from antiquity to the present day. These include the displacement of Europeans, including many Greeks, to the Middle East during the Second World War. Another event that I study is the internal displacement of the Greek and Turkish populations of the Mediterranean island of Cyprus, my home country, after its division in 1974. These events put the current refugee crisis in a much broader historical and cultural context. They each offer very different visions of Europe. Taken together, they also offer the opportunity to compare ways in which migrants and refugees from different backgrounds and in different time periods choose to describe their own experiences of displacement. Works of literature, film, and visual art about Mediterranean migration offer an understanding of Europe from a moving perspective. This is in sharp contrast to a grounded, or what I call a continental perspective, that takes the world's geopolitical and cultural arrangements to be set in stone. It is not accidental, then, that migrants and refugees crossing the Mediterranean are often described in liquid terms. They come in waves, they seep through borders. They are, to borrow the title of Ai Weiwei's most recent documentary on migration, a human flow. Consider this diary entry by Greek poet and diplomat George Seferis, who was displaced to the Middle East for much of the Second World War. Describing Greek refugees fleeing the Nazi occupation of their country, Seferis writes the following. One can almost see them. They start off sailing in their little boats from Attica or the Greek islands. They arrive in Turkey. They make their way to Egypt, and their color changes. It becomes more like ours. What happens? What made them different over there? What changes them here? Like Europa's Crossing, the transformation described by Seferis is not just a metaphor. As they cross the international waters of the Mediterranean, migrants leave behind the certainty of a well-defined legal status. They are transformed from citizens to political asylum seekers or illegal aliens, and they have to confront the new places they encounter through this changed lens. Much of what defines the experience of displacement is a lack of control. Stories of migration and other works of art try to emulate this lack of control for the readers and audience. Some of the ways they do this is to subvert linear narrative expectations or causal explanations. Films do not follow rules of continuity. Stories move through many different geographical locations. Often, like the seemingly interminable journeys of displacement, these stories do not have a clear ending at all. Fixed geopolitical and cultural boundaries define much of our knowledge and political beliefs today. Stories of migration show how fluid those boundaries really are. They teach us that it is not enough to study our world as a fixed and stable object of knowledge. And while we cannot actually inhabit the perspective of displacement unless we ourselves are forced to move, 
we can allow ourselves to be changed by works of literature and art about migration. We can allow ourselves to become more attuned to this provisional perspective, this provisional mode of being, which is a way of life for more than 60 million people that are displaced in the world today. Thank you. Wow. Eight extraordinarily eloquent, original, mind-blowing talks. Um, my goodness, I'm proud to be standing here. Um, before I invite you, fantastic audience, to join us to celebrate the Harvard Horizon Scholars in a reception out in the foyer, I'd like to invite the eight fantastic Harvard, fantastic and awesome Harvard Horizon Scholars onto the stage again, because you know what we've not celebrated yet, which is um, them as a group, because I, you know, from afar I've watched them and just the supportiveness, the feedback, the intellectual uh, toing and froing. It's been, I, I've not really been spying on you or anything creepy like that. Um, and just the warmth and um, thoughtfulness with which you've supported e uh, each other. I would really like, you, when you come up on the stage, I'd like us to celebrate that as well as your individual brilliance. Um, and then we're going to join you in the reception and celebrate. Thank you so much.